Hi, thanks for joining me. My name is Jesse Landerman. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at The Ohio State University. I work in Dr. Karen Goodell's pollinator ecology lab studying wild bees of Ohio. So today I'll be telling you how to recognize our common species of bumblebees here in Ohio and a little more about their biology and also the current bumblebee research that's happening in the Goodell lab. This video is intended for our volunteers who are going to participate in a queen bumblebee survey we're conducting in spring of 2018. So from now until June of 2018. The spring queen survey is part of a larger research project. And in 2017, the Goodell lab at OSU joined forces with Dr. Randy Mitchell's lab from the University of Akron. And together we're conducting a two year statewide Ohio Bumblebee Survey. The project was initiated and funded by the Ohio Department of Transportation in response to the listing of one of our bumblebee species, Bombus affinis, or the rusty patched bumblebee, on the federal endangered species list last spring. So the primary goal of the survey is to determine whether two bumblebee species of conservation concern still exist in Ohio, and those are Bombus affinis, the rusty patch bumblebee, and Bombus tericola, the yellow banded bumblebee. In addition, we'll be using this as an opportunity to map the distribution and habitat use of all Ohio bumblebee species. And along the way, we hope to better understand how flower availability and landscape features influence bee abundance and diversity. We're looking for volunteer naturalists this spring to help us collect two kinds of data on spring bumblebee queens. First, we're looking for people to submit their observations of queens that are searching for nest sites and the microhabitats that they're searching in. And secondly, we're also looking for volunteers who would like to conduct timed 15 minute observations of bumblebees that are feeding on patches of flowers. So if you're interested in joining us, you can see our project webpage at the OSU Bee Lab website and contact me at osubresearch at gmail.com if you'd like to sign up for that. Another way that people are getting involved in our research is to submit observations to the Ohio Bee Atlas, which is a project on a larger website called iNaturalist iNaturalist is a nationwide tool for cataloging biodiversity of all kinds. You can use it to report your observations of insects, plants, um, birds, any living thing or even fossils that you've observed. But we have a specific project on there called the Ohio Bee Atlas. You can join for free and submit observations with or without a photo. And um, there's also a web version and a mobile app for smartphones. But back to bumblebees, though. We have several hundred species of wild bees here in Ohio, but bumblebees kind of stand out among them as particularly charismatic. Um, they're large bodied and have characteristic fuzzy, usually black and yellow or black, yellow and orange look to them. And compared to our other wild bees, because they're large bodied, they can fly in cooler and windier weather conditions. They also have another trick that makes them great pollinators. They can do something called buzz pollination to unlock pollen from flowers whose pollen is stored in a little cone of male parts. Bumblebees are particularly smart for bees. They can um, learn from their nest mates where the good flowers are located and young workers also learn very quickly how to handle difficult or complicated flower shapes like monk's hood or gentian, something where the pollen is hidden. All of these things make them especially good pollinators of a few of our crop plants in particular, like blueberries and cranberries, and also things in the tomato and pepper family. This time of year in April right now, Bumblebee queens are emerging from their winter burrows and searching for new nest sites. Later in the month, once they found a suitable nest site, they'll begin gathering resources to make their first wax pots and rear their first brood. After the first brood is 
emerged in mid-May or so, then that queen will never leave the nest again. She'll stay in the nest and lay eggs and send her workers out to gather resources. And in this way, the colony will continue to grow throughout the summer until it re reaches a size of typically several hundred workers or so, or all the way up to a thousand in a really successful nest. When the colony reaches a critical size or attains a, a large amount of resources, the queen will switch to making male offspring and new queens. And then those will go out, find mates from other nests, and mate, and then the only bees from that old nest that will survive the winter are the mated queens, who will burrow down into an old rodent burrow or under piles of debris to ride out the winter, and then found a new nest the following spring. Here's an image of what an area looks like where a bumblebee queen might be hunting for new nest sites. So a lot of them nest along um, forest edges or in riparian slope areas or forest edge. And so that's what this is showing in this picture. You can see woody debris and clumps of moss. There's also leaf litter hiding little crevices where bumblebee queens might be searching for nest sites. And queens will continue to do that maybe for a week or two before they find a suitable nest site. In the summer, you can find these nests in um, old rodent dens, in or under hollow logs, in piles of vegetative debris, like a compost pile, or in the base of a large grass tussock. Uh, you might also find a bumblebee nest under a rock pile, or more rarely, in an abandoned bird nest that's on the ground, or um, in neglected human areas, like beneath a flower pot, or even inside a lawnmower in strange cases. These bumblebee nests are typically hidden from view. They're either further underground or if they're nearer the surface, they're buried under piles of vegetative debris to help hide them. So I thought I'd give you a peek into what it looks like inside of a thriving nest. So here in this picture of a nest, um, this is a bombus impatiens nest. You can see that a bumblebee nest is a big, messy pile of wax pots and brood and stored resources. So there are fresh eggs in the middle, small white eggs in the middle. You can see larvae of various sizes in here and globs of wax that are hiding more egg clusters inside. There are pupae that are getting ready to emerge into adulthood. There will also be one queen, one egg-laying queen, and her daughter queens, maybe males, and also lots and lots of workers crawling all throughout this honeycomb of pots inside the nest. There are 16 species of bumblebee known from Ohio, according to our species catalog on discoverlife.org. Last summer, through our, our survey efforts, we observed 10,000 individual bumblebees on flowers and nine species. So there are potentially seven to 10 others in the region that you could see, although they're rarely seen in Ohio. So pictured below in my lineup of cartoon drawings, these are the nine that we saw last summer in alphabetical order. And I've kind of grayed out the picture of Bombus affinis just to remind us that we're still searching for that and it's yet to be determined whether or not it still exists in Ohio. So on the next slide, try to rank these most commonly observed species for you in order of abundance, based on our research last summer and also from my dissertation research at Ohio State. So the most three, or the most common and abundant three by far are Bombus impatiens, Bombus griseoculus, and Bombus bimaculatus. And I'll be going into more detail on all of these later, so don't feel the need to try to memorize them from these small pictures. We'll go through each of these species in time. So those are the most common and abundant. There are several that are still frequently observed, but not necessarily abundant. And I lump that group as Bombus fervidus, Bombus vagans, and then a little more infrequently, but still readily observed here, are two large bumblebees with very dark wings, Bombus oricomus and Pennsylvanicus. 
and Bombus perplexus, the confusing bumblebee. On the rarer side of ones you might see are Bombus citrinus, which is a nest parasite bumblebee of some of the other common species. And then we have some very rare things that be really, really excited if you see. <laughs> Down below this, I have made a list of some of the other species that could potentially be seen in Ohio or in neighboring states, but we did not observe. And in that list, uh, they're in alphabetical order, and I've marked ones that are nest parasite species, meaning they're likely to be even more rare with an asterisk. Out of our 10,000 observations of bumblebees last summer, 95% were those three species that I mentioned were most common and abundant. Bombus impatiens was about seven out of 10 of every bumblebee that we saw, and Bombus griseocollis and Bimaculatus were, were runners up. All the, the other species that we observed made up less than 2% or 1%, half a percent of our total observations just to give you an idea of what you're dealing with. So in, the, in part two, I'll be going through each of those 10 or so species in greater detail and teaching you how to recognize them based on things that you can see with the naked eye, with color patterns. There are a few other pieces of information first though that you need before you're ready to start identifying bumblebees to species. And with bumblebees, the male and the female bees look a little bit different from each other. And so they often are separated out in the keys into a male and a female part of the key when you're identifying to species. So when you see a bee, first decide if it's male or female and then go from there. The females have a broader, shorter abdomen with six abdominal segments instead of seven as in the male. And all females, whether it's a queen or a worker, can sting. They have a stinger at the tip of the abdomen. Sometimes it'll be retracted so you can't see it, but all females can sting. Females of nest building species, so the majority of bumblebees, will have a pollen basket on the outer side of the hind leg that's a flat shiny area with several long hairs designed to carry pollen. Usually it's loaded with pollen when you see the workers and gives them this look of carrying saddle bags full of pollen. The males by comparison aren't usually, aren't intentionally collecting pollen because they're not collecting pollen to feed the brood. They're just out foraging for nectar to feed themselves. And so they're, they lack that pollen basket on the hind leg. Males also have a longer and narrower abdomen, like I mentioned, and no sting. On the face, the males will have longer antennae and larger eyes, which sometimes look kind of bugged out in a few species, and that's to help them find mates better, more sensory equipment. Males also have more yellow hair on the face, usually, and more or slightly different colors or patterns of yellow hair on the abdomen compared to the female. Once you've decided that the bee that you're looking at is female rather than male, then next you have to determine if it's a queen or a worker bumblebee. And the way to distinguish between the two is in the size of the bee and the timing or the month of the summer when you've spotted it. This time of year, you have it pretty easy. The only bumblebees that are flying are all queens. The first workers won't emerge until mid-May or so depending on the timing of the spring. And then at the other end of the season, there will be queens again, the new queens of the year that are around in July and August, looking for mates and looking for places to overwinter. Sometimes you can even see those into the fall, into September and October, depending on the species of bumblebee. In size, the queens are distinctly larger than the workers. And I've shown you some examples here from our most common species in Ohio, and that's Bombus impatiens. The queen is 17 to 21 millimeters in length, or about half to two thirds of the size of your thumb, depending on your hand size, of course. And the workers are variable in size within the species and even within a given nest. You might find workers that are eight millimeters long or all the way up to 16 millimeters long. 
So just keep in mind, worker size can be variable, but they will always be smaller than a queen. You won't always have a lot of time when you're looking at bees on a flower before they fly off to pick out the most important identifying features that you need to tell them to species. So my advice is to start with the hair color pattern on the abdomen. So try to get behind the bee and really get a good look at the hair color pattern on the abdomen. And so most of the species of bumblebee can be told apart looking at the hair on the abdomen. But for ones that might look similar, or if you can't quite tell, you can then go look at the thorax hair color or the hair color on the back of the head to see if it's black or yellow or mixed black and yellow. It's another, another clue to which species you're looking at is whether or not the females are carrying pollen. Because remember, some of those rare bumblebee species that are parasitic, um, in those species, the females lacking a pollen basket. I'll share with you a few resources that I like for identifying bumblebees to species, both web tools and one book. And I wanted to show these to you ahead of time before we move into looking at each species in turn so that you can stop and download some of them if you want and work through them as we go through the species in part two of this lecture. The first one I'll show you is a key from a website called Bee Spotter. And this website has keys for both female and male bumblebees of the Midwest and also a field guide version of the same species. If you prefer to look at the field guide version instead of the key. A second good resource is the Bumblebees of the Eastern United States. And this is a small booklet that was produced by the USDA in conjunction with Pollinator Partnership and the Forest Service. And it was written by three leading experts in the bumblebee field, Sheila Cola, Leif Richardson, and Paul Williams. The University of Minnesota Extension Office made a pocket field guide to bumblebees and many of their species there are the same as here in Ohio. So this is a good resource to print out and color, take along with you on your hikes in the field. Alternatively, if you're identifying bees from pictures later at home in front of your computer, you might wanna check out a website called discoverlife.org that has interactive pictorial keys to species. And last but not least, there's also a really nice book available called Bumblebees of North America with identification guides to all of the species of North America, not just the ones here in Ohio. So this was written by some of the same people as that USDA booklet, um, Williams et al. And you can get a copy on Amazon or from your local library fa fairly easily. So thanks for tuning in and I hope you'll come back and watch part two where we'll walk through the identifying features of 10 or so of our most common bumblebee species of Ohio.